In this episode, my friend Barry Dyke and I discuss pensions, leverage buyouts, private equity, Taylor Swift, and the Mickey Mouse plan. And we had fun doing it. Hope you enjoy, and thank you for listening. Welcome to the Banking with Life podcast. I'm your host, James Nethery. And as always, I'm excited to talk to my good friend, Barry Dyke, author, researcher, um, just an all-around great individual. If you want some research, highly documented this is your man when it comes to research in the financial world so barry thanks for being on with me again today how are you great james always good to see my good friend friend james where did i see you last where i can't remember where did i see you uh cincinnati maybe i can't remember no uh well maybe would you were you in birmingham you weren't you didn't go to birmingham no i wasn't in birmingham i guess no i wasn't in birmingham so it must have been it must have been cincinnati it's good to see you. Always good to see you, James. You're still pushing back the frontiers of ignorance, huh? <laughs> yes, yes. That's what I'm doing every day, and I know that's what you're doing as well, right? Well, we have another wonderful day in the market. What is it down? Um, how many points is it down, James? I think it's uh, like a- you know, Barry, I've been talking to uh, people all day that are not interested in the market and hadn't even looked at the market. Is it down again today? Yeah, it's, you know, it's, of course they keep pushing around. It's down seven thirty-three points. You know, yeah, up thirteen yesterday, down seven. Do you, do you think the coronavirus is even a legitimate issue? Well, I think I think it could be, and I I, I, I really do think it could be legitimate. But I, I don't think um, the way the market's being pushed around um, is a factor of the coronavirus. But that's just uh, this. So do you think the market's being manipulated as usual, or what's going yes, on? I Profit do. taken. What's, yes, what's I happening? do. Yeah, yeah. so that this is yeah, so it's, it's, it's the same old, same old, and um, you know, it's the retail investor who gets you know thrown under the uh, the bus as usual. Yeah, somebody's making money when the market goes down. It's being yeah, shorted it's, all the way. <laughs> yeah, they're, they're shorting all the way down. It's it's a club, James, and you yeah. and I are not in it, and probably your listeners are not uh, in it either. Yeah, we're not in it, and but we we really don't want to be in that club, you know the. No, we don't want to be in the club. But look, you, you um, I think the last we spoke, you kind of doing some things on target date funds, some, uh, um, aren't you doing some stuff on hedge funds? Yeah, private, private equity. equity. Yeah. yeah. So um, what I'm, I'm doing, and uh, I'm actually, we filmed one this morning, is that um, I'm going to be doing my own uh, uh, videos. They're different than yours, They're more informational, 10, 15 minute um, uh, bursts, if you will. Uh, we, we did the first one on USAA, which is um, uh, San Antonio, uh, Texas. In San Antonio, aren't they? Right? Okay. Yeah. Well, so the first one we did, um, uh, we did one on USAA, who is headquartered in in, in Texas, and uh, who has a uh, big following with the military, obviously. And um, I, it all uh, came to fruition when. Um, uh, I have a lot of clients who are, are, are pilots and, and you know, former military folks, whatever, really good people. And uh, we did the first one, James, on how USAA sold out to Wall Street, which they did. What? And, yeah. and do you want to know how, how that happened? We, they can, I'll, I'll send you the video, but do you want to know how that happened, James? How'd it happen? Well, essentially, USAA, they had a wealth management business. Um, uh, and uh, I don't know. Uh, I think maybe had like over a million, um, uh, 1.1 million actually clients in this, um, and they sold that uh, business to Schwab, uh, which is uh, you know it's the same old, same old. And uh, uh, and then uh, USA also gave them the exclusive rights to market to the USA. Uh, employees and their what? members. They, did they sell all the data? <laughs> and you get that. It, they sold yeah. access to their customers. All the analytics guys. and all that stuff. Thirteen million. They get the exclusive rights for that to market yeah. to these people, and um, and everyone thought it was a good job. But what actually, um, and people thought you know Schwab and all these companies are saying they offer free trades. Well, there's nothing for free in this life, <laughs> <laughs> James. You know, and and the thing is, what Schwab was actually making the money on the uh, the sweep accounts so in other words they were giving their their uh, depositors um, uh, roughly about 25 basis points of quarter point interest and they were taking their own money sweeping it into the schwab bank account and making maybe two 
half basis points, making roughly ninety million dollars a year on this. And oh, most people don't move their money. So, so yeah. that was that was kind of a fait accompli number one. Now the whole thing, which which is kind of bizarre about this, James, is did you ever hear about the the Schwab Yield Plus Fund? No. Okay. <laughs> well, let's just take a little go down memory lane. Down. Did I miss anything good here, Barry? Should is it? Did I miss out on something? <laughs> well, <laughs> Schwab had a, a yield plus fund, okay, which was, was supposedly better than money markets in 2007. As a matter of fact, they actually sold it to a client of mine. This this is better than money market account. Well, you know, it was 14, a 14 billion dollar fund, and you know what was stuff with James? No. Subprime mortgages, hence yield plus. So then we had the financial crisis, and the whole thing imploded. Uh, the fund went from thirteen point nine billion all the way down to like a half a billion dollars. The people really? who remained with the fund lost as much as thirty percent of their principal. And Schwab paid a a a, a, um, a fine of roughly about one hundred ten million dollars. And of course, it's the Schwab shareholders who pay this, not Charles Schwab himself. And so, so, so this has happened, okay, in 2000. But the reason I bring this up is you have these people from USAA, a lot of good military people, um, yeah. who, you know, who I, I, I like them as clients because they, um, and who essentially get thrown out of the bus in Wall Street. So that was kind of so, but most people didn't know about the U plus fund. Now, I've known you a long time. Did you ever know about that, James? No, <clears throat> I did not know about that, but no, I didn't. But it's nothing so, new. It's, it's, I mean, that's that's what goes on, you know. Charles Schwab, big name, father of discount brokerage. Oh yeah, right. Oh, yeah. And then pays for the access to uh, how many how many account holders does USA even have? Well, as part of this deal, USA gave Schwab one point one million clients, James. We know, like, since they have one point one million clients delivered to your your desk, the wealth management division. Wow. And but they get the exclusive marketing rights. To 13 uh, million, uh, 13.1 million uh, members, um, because they've actually they're known for their very good service. Okay, but so this sure. is kind of a, again Wall Street, you know, and of course you know Schwab uses debt and everything to buy this thing, and and they they're making all the money on this as as usual. Yeah, they probably own the uh, financing entity that financed the deal too. <laughs> well, yeah, well that's probably Wall Street. They, they it's going down in Wall Street, you know. With, with, who knows, Goldman Sachs and Morgan Stanley, whoever the case may be. Right. But that was one piece of it. And then the second piece was that they had a mutual fund business, um, James, uh, an ETF business and a college savings plan business, yeah. which was another piece. And they sold that off to a company called Victory Capital. Now, have you ever heard of who Victory Capital was? I've heard the name, but I know nothing about them. Uh, okay, well, this is an interesting one. Well, this would Victory Capital was a um, was the asset management business of uh, Key Bank, and they carved it out in a leverage buyout. I think for like two hundred thirty six million dollars in like two thousand eleven or twelve or something like that. So essentially, they bought the company uh, with management and, and Crestview Partners, who they partnered with in <laughs> in uh, New York, a private equity firm. So they carved out the asset management business out of Key Bank, and of course, what they do instead of calling it Key Bank, they re rebranded it Victory Capital. It sounds really successful, right? It's a great name, uh, and that's what they, they always do. They buy the company and change the name, and then they um, um, they uh, accelerated the business, and then they they were the Crestview uh, or Crestview Capital or Victory Capital was the entity that bought the uh, USAA. Uh, mutual fund and college savings business. So they get more business, I don't know how many hundreds of thousands of clients they got there, but uh, the funds weren't, weren't that good. But, but but this is a private equity deal. And um, and, and, and people say, who is Crestview Partners? Well, I didn't really know too much about them, them myself, James, but as you know, I've been work, researching a book on private equity. And I said, well, you know, you, sh you should know that Crestview Partners actually just, um, Partnered with um, who do they partner with? The uh, oh, it was up with KKR. Okay, in around 2011, they they bought a leverage buyout of um, Samson Oil Company for 7.2 billion, and they went into bankruptcy, James. 
So the company had very little debt. It was an Oklahoma oil and, oil and gas company with very little debt before they went, um, they were taken over by Crestview and KKR. Uh, and, but then they, they had like 700 million in debt, but when they went bankrupt in 2015, they had like 4.2 billion in debt. And this is Crestview Partners, the same people who own Victor Capital, the same people who are ma- ma- managing the money of the USAA people. Well, what all, what, what all did they do with that $42 billion in debt? Who got all that money, Barry? Well, it was other people's money, James. You know that, James, <laughs> not their money. <laughs> I know. Somebody walked away with it. Somebody got paid. I bet they were financing, you know, uh, special dividends and bonuses with all that debt. Yes, they I were. Yes, they were. But, th- but then there was another one. Um, and then there's one more, the third one. And I'm not saying beginning the great state of Texas. And these, uh, so then there was another one, which um, there was a call company called Cumulus Media, James. Oh, and yeah. they were the second largest um, radio station uh, company other than iHeart uh, Radio, which also went bankrupt under private equity ownership, which yeah. is, which, which is, which I think they were based out of Fort Worth, by the way. But anyway, um, but uh, Crestview owned um, a $500 million stake in, in Cumulus Media, and they, they invested in 2011, and then they went bankrupt, too, in um, 2017. So my point is that Crestview was, was a key uh, private equity firm be, behind Cumulus Media, and they're the key private equity uh, firm be, behind Samson Oil, and now they're the key private equity firm uh, behind uh, Victory Capital who bought the USA business. Yeah. Now, what I've also learned recently, this has been the past day or two, is that um, Crestview is also a partner in the um, a company called Camp uh, Camping World, which is a company based out of, they sell RVs, James, they're one of the biggest in the country. Um, oh, they're, yeah. on, they're listed on the NASDAQ or the New York, I forget what it is. But th- this, which is run by Marcus Lemonis, the prophet from CNBC. No. But they but they have like three class action lawsuits for like uh, insider trading and dumping shares. So it's it's gonna be really interesting what happens. But this is kind of what what goes on in Wall Street on a day to day basis. And you know, and, um, and I'm always I'm always you know it's just it's about other people's money. And yeah, uh, yeah. well, I mean that's just the the way they. They do a leverage buyout. They, the the private equity groups. I mean, they've they've created a pattern over the last twenty years, haven't they? They uh, create a leverage buyout. They take over a company that's potentially solid on the balance sheet, looks good. They leverage it up. All the bankers get paid. All the bankers, <laughs> yes, indeed. Then they go into bankruptcy. They even finance the deal with with um, entities that they own to finance the deal. They go into bankruptcy, liquidation, and then I'll bet you, I bet you, it's not unheard of, Barry, that these same entities go and buy up all the scraps out of bankruptcy. Well, and that's do what it they all do, again. James. <laughs> that's what they do, James. Okay, they buy what is called distressed debt. So this is really bizarre, but it, it's sick, but it's true. So let's give an example. Uh, let's give an actual example. There was Cengage Publishing, which was one of the largest college publishers. It was taken private in a leverage buyout by Apex Partners, a private equity firm out of London, but actually got a lot of the money from U.S. pension funds, if you can believe it. <laughs> so anyway, <laughs> they were located in Stamford, Connecticut, oh employed like, you know, 5,300 people in the area in 35 countries, a big publishing college, publishing company. They did a leverage buy for 7.7, uh, 7, $2 billion. Um, they went into bankruptcy, I believe, in 2013, right around there. I, they, I, know, I know they went bankrupt, okay. But as they're going into bankruptcy, James, as you know, in a bankruptcy, the, it's the debt holder who takes over um, – from the equity holder, the equity equity holder gets wiped out. And the people yeah. own the debt, own that bone of the company. So as the company is going, essentially charging toward bankruptcy, uh, another entity which they own, Apex owned, bought all the debt. No way. From same gauge. So when they <laughs> so the company so when the company went into bankruptcy, they own the company. They just put it into bankruptcy. Ooh, I'm shocked, Barry. I'm shocked. I can't believe this kind of stuff goes on in Wall Street. <laughs> It happens all the time. And then, of course, all the money's uh, – not all the money, but a lot of the capital is resides in the uh, 
pension funds of the all-American citizen or in their IRA or their 401k. Um, or the Texas teaches retirement system where the, the TR, you're in Texas, you have a big one. A couple have a big ones down there. Oh, yeah, it's, the it's good, The retirement too. system and the TRS, Texas yep. retirement system. Yep. Yeah, so it's, it's really, it's really the, the honeypot for Wall Street, the retirement plans and the, the gigantic uh, public pension funds, the Texas plans. Calvers is certainly the biggest, but you got Florida um, and California and all this. And so this, so they gamble with other people's money, and then they dump it onto public entities. It's it's um, but this, so this is some of the stuff which is going on right now. And business is good too because they keep doing that over and over and over. Yeah, a lot the, of activity. Yeah, and the fees are really big, and uh, you know the bankers love the private equity business because they. Uh, they, the private equity firms pay top dollar for the uh, uh, for the services, so they pay a big commission. So the banks love it, and the uh, the, the private equity financiers love it because there's um, they get taxed very very lightly. So um, you know, the you know, last time I uh, seen a commercial of, on USAA, I paused the old big screen TV so I could read the fine print. Yeah. <laughs> I don't know why I did it. I, I typically do it when I see these great 0% financing deals, just to quickly run through the math. But on this particular commercial, there was a real serious disclosure at the bottom that was disclaiming the notion that USAA members were uh, disclaiming the idea, the notion that there is any ownership position for the members. You know, so it was, it was just a disclaimer. It's like we're not a mutual company. The the policyholders are not an owner of the company in any way. Um, are you familiar with their disclaimer on their commercials? Have yeah, you seen I, yeah but aren't they still a mutual company, James? I thought I thought USA was a mutual company. That was kind of the, that was one of the real benefits of the company. Am I correct? Well, I thought they were mutual a mutual company too. But I learned too that USAA is like an um, it, it's not what I thought it stood for. Uh, I can't recall now what USAA stands for, but it's like an automobile association. Yeah, well, it was servicemen. It was, it was set up for servicemen to self fund their auto because they had a hard time getting auto insurance originally. I guess back in the twenties, right? And they, and they they built up a really good relationship. But the people are very very loyal. I mean, I have clients. Yes, who have gotten out of USAA and they still have their their. I, uh, I have pilots who are, they still have their, their car and auto insurance uh, and their homeowners with the USA. So, um, yeah, sure. And- I, look, I'm in Texas. I'm born and raised in Fort Worth. We have a lot of clients, USAA, and I'm not beating up USAA. We're talking about the the money, the cash flows behind the names. <laughs> you know, that's what we're talking about. But two, when you when you talk about the private equity, um, tell me what's going on with. Taylor Swift, you know I've got a twelve-year-old oh, daughter, and uh, oh, that's I think right. okay. I think Taylor's a beautiful performer. Um, yeah. Well, this is this was kind of a. Um, Am I jumping the gun here? Well, no, but it hasn't been released yet. But you'll be one of the first to know. But, it, but I have, it's been done. It's been edited. We just haven't. We have to get all these uh, videos to re- reside in one place. Um, but any event. Um, uh, Taylor Swift came out, and you have a younger daughter, right? And all, all the girls, they love her. They, what do they call them, Swifties, I guess, or her fans? Yeah, yeah. And uh, I was just amazed. And, and she's a very bright uh, young lady. She's like 29, 30, whatever. As a matter of fact, there was a Netflix special on her, which I thought was pretty good. Um, you know, so I, I'm, I, and I like, I like her music. You know, I don't listen to it all the time, but I, I think some of it's really good. She's very creative and um Yep, so, but anyway, in, in December of uh, 2019, this this past year, she was, she was voted uh, the woman of the year uh, of the decade under Billboard for uh, as a as a, uh, a musical artist. So she was uh, voted the woman of the decade, which is quite an, an incredible feat. Wow! Um, but she also at the, at the and this is public uh, information, and people can Google the uh, uh, Billboard awards. Around around the eleventh to twelfth minute, she lays into private equity because what happened is um, she had a her, she had a uh, her music portfolio was owned by a company called Big Machine Music. Uh, a guy by the name of Scott Borchetta actually backed her when she was like fifteen years of age. So I'm really not 
I don't feel bad for Taylor Swift, okay, because she made a lot of money on it, and, and um, I think she made two hundred sixty-six million in her tour last year, and I don't know, Forbes said she's worth about three hundred sixty million. But any event, so she made the mo- most of it last year, huh? <laughs> yeah, she, so, so she made she, she makes a lot of money, okay? Sure, sure. You no, know, and she's very talented. And I'm all for very. it. Very. Yeah. Um, but the thing is, is the um, what happened with Taylor Swift was um, the her, the music catalog, uh, which uh, Scott Borchetta owned, and uh, was sold um, to a guy by the name of Scooter Braun, who was backed by George Soros and the Carlisle Group. Oh, yeah. You know, so it's, you know, again, and this is, you know, people don't know about this. Um, but what I thought with the point of my video is that I don't think she'd get a, a, such a bad deal uh, having your music catalog being bought. But I think the more important thing is that Taylor Swift exposed the world of private equity. Because people, James, how many people do you know knows about private equity leverage buyouts? Not many. That's why we're talking, Barry, part of the reason why we're talking. I want people to know. I want yeah, people right. to know so, what you know. So this, this is what I, I thought you, I said, man, this this girl's got, you know, she's got, uh, I don't know, there's a, she's got, you know, there's a expression for it. She's got a lot of courage, okay, to say this stuff. That's right. And so I said, you know, yeah, I said, go, go for it, girl. And, you know, I don't think she'd get that bad of a deal because there's actually precedent in this um, when um, actually Michael Jackson bought the, the Beatles music catalog Oh, gee, was back in the 80s and for like 43 million. Then Matt, Michael sold half of it to Sunny Music for like 100 million. Then the the uh, the Jackson Estate sold the rest of it to like for 700 million to Sony. So there was precedent in this. And Taylor Swift's father was a financial advisor for, for out of ten, out of Nashville mm-hmm. for Merrill. So they, they, you know, it's it hard for me to see that they would. Uh, but my point is that she really exposed the dark uh, corner of. Uh, of uh, Wall Street, and matter of fact, she just came up with a new video. So we're well, going to try to tie you into this. Uh, I, uh, called the man. Mm-hmm. Uh, ask, ask your daughter. I guess the man is, is the name of the video. It's already got 14 million hits, but part of the the video is really about um, uh, the Carlisle back group backing uh, the buyout of her music. Is that right? Yeah. So it's just. I love it. And then, then, it's, then uh, what I bring up to people is that, you know, you know, has Par- Carlisle put a lot of com- companies in, in, into financial straits? Oh, yeah. Yeah. HCR, Manicare, the second largest nursing home care company, Acosta Sales and Marketing in um, uh, Jacksonville, Florida, the, uh, the Carlisle Capital, all these companies, um, uh, IMO, Car Wash, all these companies they put in, into bankruptcy. Um, and um, but you know but but like Taylor Swift, uh, Dave Rubenstein, who runs the Carlisle Group, has his own uh, television show on Bloomberg. So it's uh, you know we're just I'm, you're just down in t- Texas and I'm just up in New Hampshire. So <coughs> this right. is all true, James. Well, Barry, tell it tell tell us why these leverage buyout firms bankrupt these companies. I mean, it's just not a it's not a side hobby for them saying, hey, there's a company over there. Let's go bankrupt them. I mean, walk us through the profitability of a of bankrupting a company. Just walk us through the profitability of that whole process of buying, bankrupting. You know, give us an idea of why well, they keep doing it over and over and over. It's so bloody profitable, James. <laughs> it's so bloody profitable. It's simple. Because first of all, all they do is they put up a little sliver of their own money. So there's really... There's, you know, so if it's a hundred million day deal, and this is a tiny deal, by the way, hundred million is small. So if they put up a hundred million, if they're buying a hundred million dollar deal, let's say, and that's tiny. I mean, that's really tiny. Um, they only put maybe one percent of the, their own capital up, or say roughly around one percent, and then they're going to get roughly twenty percent of the other capital that this by this entity, whether it be Taylor Music, a Taylor Swift music catalog, or a business or real estate. They get 20% of that capital from the state pension funds, i.e. Texas or Illinois or California, okay? And then the rest of it is acquired with debt or 80% of the debt. So there's a sliver of their own money involved to begin with. They get most of the real money from the limited partners, and but they, but they get the real big money is in the form of debt from Wall Street. So 
so and then when they put the de uh, the deal together, James, they generally get about one and a half percent banking fee to put the deal together. So if they put a million bucks in and they're getting a one and a half percent investment banking fee, their money good from day one. Yeah, they're profitable from day one. <laughs> they're, so the problem they're, now, and on top of that, they're getting a management fee fee of two percent on the whole deal. And then they're also getting charged monitoring fees and fees fees on fees, and they're locking up their the, 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 whether it be the Texas retirement system, they're locking up this money for ten to fifteen years, and, and so that's the limit of partnership agreements. And there's a guy by the name of, um, uh, which I recommend your uh, uh, viewers. So there's a guy by the name of Ted Sedell. Robert Kiyosaki just came up with this book, "Who Stole My Pension?" And there's oh, yeah. an SEC attorney, Ted Sedell. We get into this, but um, so the thing is, so they they're, so they buy this company with all this debt. They're getting a big management fee, but if they go into bankruptcy, James, if if, they, if there's none of their money at risk, it's not my problem. Now the taxpayer subsidizes this whole bloody mess because, as you know, well, interest to, to in business is deductible. So the taxpayer, the individual taxpayer, is really underwriting this whole predatory model. And then when they sell it, let's, and let's say they buy this business for $100 million, and then they, they are successful at it, because there are there has been some very successful uh, leverage buyouts. Sure. Once, some that keep, come to mind are Gulfstream Aircraft, when Ted Forsman, Forsman <coughs> Little, sold, he bought it from Chrysler and then sold it to, I forget who it was, whatever. But he, he did a really good job. And, and um, um, but So there has been successes in this business. But when the business say that we buy that business for $100 million, we sell it for, say, $200 million, the general partners who are the private equity firms get 20% of that money as a carry or carried interest. And then the the, uh, the limited partners with the state pension funds primarily, they get 80% of the gain. Now, because it's a pension plan change, we really don't care about tax because there is no, as you know, there's no tax within a pension plan. But for the private equity guys who get this money, this 20% or 20 million as profit, it's tax at capital gains rates. Sure. So, so it, it, it's 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 you know it's looting, um, you know America. And this is um, one thing is as much as I don't like you know Elizabeth Warren or sometimes uh, she she goes and rants about this, but she's right. So th so this is kind of the model um, what we're seeing. And then then this is of course my concern uh, that um, some of the light companies like. Um, uh, uh, Apollo Global Management have gotten into a theme, so it's a. Uh, and this this should concern everybody, but no one's really talking about it. Yeah, I I would only agree that Mrs. Mrs. Warren is correct on that little sliver of the pension that she talks about. She's a complete anti-capitalist, and I believe she has capitalism confused with crony capitalism or corporatism or mercantilism. Yeah. So, and, and, and I agree with you, James. But this is, you know, private equity is truly, you know, it's the epitome of crony capitalism. And you that, have big, absolutely. You know, and you have big firms down in Texas, you know, as well. Oh yeah. Well, the um, the other thing on, uh, you know, the the pensions, the that's a that's a big business now. This pension risk transfer. I don't know yeah. the correct terminology, <laughs> but all of these life insurance companies are buying out uh the pension obligations and if if you just think that through if that doesn't tell you there's um something going on with these companies these corporations and their pensions they can't they can't meet their debt obligations they can't meet their future obligations so they're offsetting that liability to the life insurance companies yeah um, there's an awful lot of that going on and it's been going on for several years now yeah and again this is you know um um the research which I've done, James. As a matter of fact, um, I don't know if I've sent it to, but uh, um, I subscribe some a lot of stuff. Most people won't spend the money to, but I, luckily I have an inside edge just because I subscribe to some stuff. But um, Limra, which is the Life Insurance Market Research Institute out of uh, it was Connecticut, okay, they just released a study this past uh, week, which. Um, found that the level of pension buyouts with annuities by U.S. corporations, uh, there was over 501 
501 uh, corporations, James, who transferred their risk of their pension plan to insurance companies because they don't want to do it anymore. So you have these, I'll, I'll give you a great example. Um, Bristol Myers Squibb, they totally, they, they're out of the pension business. They bought a huge annuity. I forget how much it was, three billion or something like that. For, um, uh, uh, and, and it goes on and on and on. But, but my point is, is that retail investors, um, including our clients, are being told to put all their money in, into mutual funds and ETFs and all these other crap. I don't know. I mean, and I'm not, you know, we manage some of this stuff, so don't get me wrong. We, we, but sure. we just try to give people the truth. Um, so what you're seeing is that it's huge. Now, what I've done, because it evolves some research in the UK, because it's actually this trend, James, started in the UK. Uh, and so, like, I think uh, the, the giant investment bank, uh, HSBC, Hong Kong, oh, yeah. Bank Corp, I, thought, I think they bought like a $13 billion uh, 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 annuity pension buy-in. So the whole thing is, is that we're – all the main street investors are get it buying the dip and all this all this crap and, and but, but when these banks and other institutions are doing the exact opposite uh, the same is true for lehman brothers uh they bought a billion dollar annuity uh bank of america merrill lynch in the uk bought a half a billion dollar annuity for 500 employees so it goes on and on, and on. so the hypocrisy is just incredible yeah i tell you what like that apollo it, it is amazing there's nothing new under the sun there either the, the banks, Wall Street's telling you to do one thing and they're doing the exact opposite and telling you, oh, don't look over here, nothing to see here, keep your head down, you know, keep buying on the dip, keep working hard, don't look buying up. the dip, yeah, dollar, yeah. Dollar, dollar, dollar cost averaging. Which, <laughs> yeah. You know, a lot of this stuff is just, makes no mathematical sense. No, but, but it, it sounds it, good and it makes it a good sounds, presentation. It sounds really good. <laughs> yeah. That Apollo, uh, I think, uh, you know, the uh, companies like Apollo, I think they're, they're they're accessing the reserves of these life insurance companies and they're they're legitimately and and two look uh berkshire berkshire hathaway does the same thing with geico and swiss re um they're all banking with life insurance most of them the big ones are banking with life insurance now think that one through what do they know that we don't know barry what do they know well these guys, I don't know, call them what you will, okay, but they're, 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 they're not dumb. No. And, and um, you know, they understand that uh, money within a life insurance policy is very sticky, um, and, 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 it's, and it's a good uh, place to uh, reserve, uh, or, or how can I put, park capital, if you will. And this is not, nothing new is under the sun, uh, James. If you remember, if we reach our, into our history books and we look at what J.P. J.P. Morgan was doing this crap uh, 100 years ago in New York. He created one of the largest banking uh, insurance scandals of, of all time. And when, when everyone found out that J.P. Morgan was raiding the reserves in New York Life, um, Mutual of New York, and then the Equitable, which I think has been, re, re, um, re, um, re, been relaunched, I guess. Okay, so J.P. Yeah, Morgan they just broke crap. off of AXA. <clears throat> yeah, so they, okay, AXA's been doing <clears throat> yeah. So Well, J.P. they deemed it. Equitable demutualized. AXA purchased them, a French company, and now they're breaking, breaking off, of, uh, breaking away from AXA, and they're trying to, they're trying to embrace their history, you know, the old mutual life insurance company history, um, that nostalgia. But they're they're a stock company, and they can't go remutualize. Company. But the point is, J.P. Morgan was doing this a hundred years ago, <clears throat> and that really that's test, and there was. The Barry, Oxford. that's why we have Barry. That's why I'm sorry, but that's why we have all the the strict, not the only reason, but that's part of the very reason we have the strict insurance laws, especially in New York. Penn Mutual quit writing business in New York in 2020. Yeah. Well, why? Um, because the life insurance industry has a history of some sh- shenanigans. They're not driven, you know, uh, pure as a driven snow. Um, and so I'm just speaking to. Adding to your comments of history, J.P. Morgan doing that, and keep going. So, and, and thanks and so, for letting me so interrupt. This is what but. Apollo Global has done, okay, with their theme. And um, there's a great uh, people um, this year uh, go on to uh, Google and, and they get the Financial Times article. But um, that's a whole story into itself. But it's 
Um, it's it's incredible. So what essentially, as you know, some of the companies we, we've done business with, the portfolios are, are very well constructed, okay? And particularly in this day and age, and you know, you, you, I've been in board meetings with you, James, and I've been right up front with the board members and how much is junk bonds in there and what's the duration, they've been very honest because I ask them, because yeah. we're putting our, our clients' money in this stuff. And they've been very, very prudent, the ones we do. The problem with people like Apollo and and um, and then uh, which owns Athene and then Guggenheim, which owns Security Benefit Life, and now uh, Goldman owns um, uh, Global Atlantic and Blackstone owns F and G. Uh, what they're doing is they're gutting their portfolios uh, with the with the good corporate bonds and high quality stuff, and they're and they're essentially gutting them and replacing them with a lot of their junk bonds and crap like that. So this is you know this is this is kind of repeat. Um, of, of what J.P. Morgan did 100 years ago, uh, but I think it's even more important because I think you would both agree that uh, the life insurance companies are still one of the best places for money to reside within a society. There's no question about it. Absolutely. It, it, it's unequivocal, done. But the thing is, what would, 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 would scare me, <laughs> if you were frightened of me, is that you get in these companies like these financiers like Apollo, and uh, bankrupting uh, companies left and right. And people say, well, who we'll follow bankrupt? Well, you ever hear of Claire Stores? You ever hear of um, Caesars Casinos, uh, uh, Caesars Entertainment? You ever hear of uh, uh, one of the uh, Constellas, which is their old, uh, the old BlackRock, uh, uh, no, no, the, um, who was the, uh, the military contractor? Black, Blackwater. Blackwater, yeah, Blackwater. And they invest, you know, that's essentially gone for a debt for equity swap. There's a lot of things, a lot of these companies, that, they banked a lot of companies. Another one was, um, there's a whole bunch of them. But so my point is, is that um, I don't think that, James, I don't know, would you would you want to put your client's money with someone who's bankrupting uh, their portfolio companies? <laughs> no, no, thank you. <laughs> no, not at all. I want my clients to put the money where I put my money. Yeah. Dividend yeah, paying so- whole life insurance. That's what I want. If it if it's suitable and if it yeah makes I mean sense. it's not for everybody right. Dwayne you, right. you know but we have to be honest and that um, uh, but this is you know if you understand economics the life companies the particularly mutual ones would be the last one standing you know? yeah you know we've joked for years and years that at the end of the world you know at the end of this Earth age there's going to be three things left Twinkies cockroaches and mutual life insurance companies. That's how. And Twinkies, by the way, they're owned by a private equity firm too. They're owned by Caldwell <laughs> Management. Are they really? They oh, were. They were God. flipped. Yeah, they actually Paul Global Management. They bought them out of bankruptcy. And you're just making my day worse, Barry. Jeez. <laughs> <laughs> Twinkies, tweets, and tweets, <laughs> and mutual life. But Apollo owned them too. Yeah. Then, uh, but yeah, so they. Uh, I did not know that. Yeah, they did. <laughs> All right, so tell me about uh, Morgan Stanley. I don't, I can't, you know, put my fingers on the articles, but I've read cursory. Have read several articles lately about Morgan Stanley. You know, the next big opportunity is is uh, green energy and renewable energy, and then the way I've seen on different talking heads programs on TV that this keeps coming up over and over, and it and it just. I smell something deeper than just, you know, social uh, justice, kind of a social movement. There's something financial going on behind the scenes that looks to me like. Do you know anything about all? Well, I don't know, Jason, but but, but what what, 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 um, most people don't know, and uh, I remember revised that the guaranteed income, I'm going to put this chart in there, that you know how much um, – Morgan Stanley got uh, in, in liquidity lines during the financial crisis, James? No. About two trillion. That's and, a big number, thank even you, for thank government. God. And, and thank God, you know who was responsible for getting that information? Actually, it was Bernie Sanders. So I can understand why he has a following, because he, he actually petitioned the GAO, and he actually he, he said, Fed, you know, who did you give money to? It was Citigroup, Morgan Stanley, but anyway. So, but... On, the, on this ES and G was environmental, social, and what do they call it? Growth or whatever. Uh, corporate response, ESG, or what, I, what do they call it? Environmental, social, I don't know. 
But I think what, what bothers me is that how Morgan Stanley, they just bought E-Trade, like thirteen <laughs> billion. They have access to their all of those accounts and all of that data, big data, just like for marketing Schwab, purposes. Meaning, so, yeah. Now the whole thing is that people don't know that Morgan Stanley just last year they bankrupted a major uh, supermarket chain in upstate New York called Tops Markets. I can't believe that. They, doesn't anyone looking at what these guys are doing? No, we're all too busy out here just trying to, you know, make a living. Get the bills yeah, paid. Then, but, yeah, but, and, um, but didn't anyone uh, – there was another one. They had a uh, – no one was – Morgan Stanley uh, helping finance uh, casinos. They helped build one from scratch. It's called Ravel down in Atlantic City. Yeah, they built one from scratch. They went to bank uh, two or three times, and now it's renamed <laughs> something or other. Whatever. But the biggest mm. thing, and I was in California last week, and I actually drove by this old. Uh, uh, the biggest thing was uh, Morgan Stanley was the was the main banker behind New Century Financial, really? uh, which which was essentially the, it was like the Walmart of wholesaler of uh, of uh, subprime mortgages in two thousand and seven, which ended up going bankrupt, which Morgan Stanley had, ended up paying like three point two billion in fines, something like something ridiculous like that. But hmm. so this is, you know, so this is what we're, you know, um, I, I think it's more than ever a, a need for guys like you and me, really, for people to just get independent advice. I agree. Uh, I completely agree. Well, what are you what are you working on besides your fourth book? Some of this, uh, some of these topics that we kind of talked about today, USAA, the, the leverage buyouts, um, Taylor Swift, that's that's a leverage I mean, that's an equity group, the uh, private equity. Yeah, group oh, the, oh, then the private equity. Uh, the, another thing which will, this will be released, I'm kind of, uh, but though people will see this, um, uh, which is very frightening. Um, Vanguard announced they're getting into the private equity. <laughs> <laughs> what? Vanguard? Oh, no. Oh, Vanguard, yeah. yeah, yeah. You mm -hmm. know, so, yeah, Vanguard announced uh, the, this past week that this is going to bring private leverage buyouts to every man now. Oh, perfect. Now, because we're these, all going to have an opportunity to participate in this, huh? <laughs> and also, oh who's doing it too is BlackRock, which is the biggest, with seven point two trillion of assets under management. And and I can't believe they're doing this because the last time BlackRock did a, a leverage buy in two thousand six with Tishman Spare in New York City. I don't know. You ever go to New York City, James? Where you, uh, Not yet. Rock, you know the Rockefeller is, is that big, huge, Peter Cooper Village, uh, uh, Bed Bedford Stuy Town. It's a, it was a, uh, it's, I forget how many buildings. It's like eleven thousand apartments or forty buildings. It's it's wow. incredible. It's, it's it, it was a middle class oasis uh, built by Metropolitan Light in the in the nineteen forties. People what is it called? I've never heard of it. Uh, Peter Cooper Village, uh, Bedford oh, okay. uh, Stuy Vesson Town. It's okay. the Dutch place. But anyhow, it was an oasis where people with families could get a moderate housing. It was under rent control. So with last time, this is the large, last large uh, leverage buyout, which um, BlackRock did with Tishman Spare, which is essentially a huge New York uh, real estate firm. And uh, <laughs> and uh, they did it for like a leverage buyout for $6.2 back in 2006. And they went into and they went into default in 2010. They ended up handing over the keys to Barclays, so they they couldn't get they couldn't get rid of the rent control. Right. So so I think they ended up getting rid of it for like 3.2 billion. So they bought it for 6.2 billion. <laughs> they get rid of it for 3.2 billion. But listen to this: Cal Calvers lost like a half a billion bucks as, as their own money. Calsters, the California teachers, uh, lost like a hundred million dollars. The state of Florida lost like a hundred fifty bucks, hundred fifty million, and they even took the Church of England for like seventy million, James. Wow. Now the irony of the whole thing is, it ends up in it goes through default, and they they, they give up the key. Essentially, uh, you know, these private firms they can put things either into bankruptcy, or default, or a net debt for equity swap. They, they and, and ends up being back in private equity firms, and now it's owned by Blackstone LP. And they're able to get uh, rid of the rent control, and they jacked up all the rents. So, um, 
So this is, is now this to cash is the last, flow. This is the, <laughs> so this is the last um, uh, time BlackRock, uh, was, is, which is the largest asset manager in the world, was in private equity, and now they have a, uh, a new uh, portfolio coming called Authentic Brands. So, so this is kind of the, the same old, same old James. So, um, but so people instead of you know saving money, I mean, we don't as you know. I think the big thing, James, is the is there is no financial education. What, what do you say about that? Oh, I completely agree. There is no legitimate financial education. Um, and then what passes today as financial education is appallingly lacking. You know, they don't. <clears throat> um, so I agree with you. It doesn't exist. What passes as financial ap- uh, education is is just lacking. It's appalling. So, but there's a ton of noise, right? We're we're surrounded by the noise, and financial noise is some of the worst. And what we hear from daylight to dark is, you know, put your money in the market and cash is terrible. Do. Don't, yeah, <laughs> you know, get rid of your cash quickly, and then rely on uh, Saks Fifth Avenue if you want anything and everything that's new and shiny. Just go throw some plastic on it, put it on credit cards. It's like, it's spin now, spin, 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 spin. And it's the, uh, the idea of savings, having accumulating capital is almost shunned in the financial world, you know? And, and so I agree that the financial education does not exist and the all American average individual would do themselves and their future prodigy well by accumulating capital and accumulating it appropriately and in my preference is in properly structured dividend paying life insurance policies as a foundational place to put money and then build from that whatever it is you want to invest in primarily you should invest invest in yourself my opinion exactly you should invest in your own business or your family's business and if you don't have a business to invest in you should finance everything that you're family is doing through life insurance as a foundation you can grow from there and do whatever it is you want you have a solid foundation you can build anything on top of that that you wish but i think that that's very fundamental and foundational and that's what i get up every day um trying to promote and advance the idea that you can become your own banker at the you and me level with the infinite banking concept the work of nelson nash um so thanks for asking me that and and, and uh, giving me the opportunity to share this idea of becoming your own banker. And I want to put a lot of stuff in the notes below um, before I get off. And Barry James Dyke is your website. Yeah, BarryJamesDyke.com. Yeah, yeah. So that and, and yeah. So uh, and people can email me whatever. You know me. I'm pretty open. And yeah, I'll put your email in there as well. And I. We, we sell a lot of your books, Barry. We have... Uh, well, I thank you, and, and my children thank you, and uh, <laughs> right. my, my, my overhead thank you. As you know, this, uh, you, you've done your videos, and, and I've done the books and stuff like that. This, this really no, it's more educational. This really, it's, it's really about giving back. It's a, it's a labor no of love. Those are, very, those are so not profitable, but they do um, create relationships that that uh can be profitable and enjoyable um, but i'll put i'll put the link to your books to your website and then too with some of these videos that you're recording currently and uh and and are going to produce or, and make available can if you i'd be willing to put those in the the links yeah, to those yeah, videos I'm, also, I'm doing something on index funds because i call index funds the, the communist funds now or, or <laughs> The you can, are, it's uh, like the Hotel California. You can check in anytime you like, you but you can never you leave. Want, you can never leave. Yeah. <laughs> and target date funds, you know. And uh, I'm di- I did a piece on target date funds, um, and uh, you know, and passive funds, you know, because you know, passive. I you know, I know you manage money. I, 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 I'm, I am a, I'm a believer of it on modern portfolio theory. In theory. But does it really guarantee anything? No, it doesn't. And um, now we could do a whole show on modern portfolio theory. Oh um, yeah, you, 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 and I'm, you know, I drank the Kool Aid on that stuff. Okay, and I, and I okay. believe, but not, and I did, but I think it is in theory. Okay, 
and but we just don't, James. We don't know what we're going to have for. Uh, we don't know what's going to happen next week, or uh, we don't know how long we're going to live or die. We just don't know. So a lot of this. Stuff that's what's. That's one thing that's great about the future, Barry. Besides, it's going to be good. It's unknown. If we knew the future, we might not be interested. I don't know, or might want to, you know, rush it along. The future is unknown, and that's a that's a benefit. That's a positive. <laughs> Yeah, and also, and um, yeah, but uh, but anyhow, getting back to our friend Nelson Nash, though, you know, she was, you know, you talked to him all the time, and she's, I, I talked to him almost right up to when he died, and you know, uh, have you seen that video of his um, uh, on his life? <clears throat> um, yeah, the the uh, the quote unquote documentary of Nelson Nash, I've seen that. It's a good work. Jason Rink did that, and I think it's more of a. Uh, I think it's less of a documentary and more of a, of a, a, a maybe a documentary of the Nelson Nash Institute. But yeah. I have seen that. <clears throat> and uh, I did talk to him all the time. You know, I talked to him two days before his surgery, and then we had two podcasts scheduled. So I dearly miss him. But, you know, you, you've known Nelson a long time. How long did you know Nelson before he graduated? Oh, gee, he was, he was a very dear man in my life. Um, uh, I, I remember, too, that when we would, you and I, if we, when we crossed paths wherever over the last several years, we would always, I'd pull up my cell phone and we would call Nelson. Oh, yeah, we, he, used, he was, we were doing <laughs> FaceTime right up till he died. Huh? Yeah. He was, he, he was great. I remember that. So how long did how long did you? Uh, oh, know she Nelson? was I don't know, fifteen, sixteen years. He was the guy really told me, showed me from a, I mean, economic, uh, economics point of view, the life insurance was such a great tool. And it was as Bob Castle and I was a leap guy, disciple of leap as well. So I knew from a, from a mathematical perspective, really, because uh, that the, the other financial products didn't work. Um, so. Uh, it was Nelson who showed me from economic, and then it was Castellone who showed me how to do all this, uh, to tear apart all the stuff which is being presented to us. But the Nelson was really grateful because when I started doing the research, um, because I had to reinvent myself, I had gone through a very tough time, divorce, all that crap. Um, so I had to reinvent myself, and then, but Nelson, when I, I was the guy who discovered that this is where the banks put all their money, uh, with a life insurance company. So. But Nelson, he was just, um, he was very, very kind to me. And um, he, uh, the first book he really encouraged. And the second book, I was still I wasn't off the ground. He helped finance that. And uh, I paid him right back, but he, I couldn't have done it without him. And, uh, Which book? You know, the, the, the second book, Pirates of Manhattan, or the first two, Pirates of Manhattan? I would have surfed him. Okay. I still was, I still was a kind of, uh, it was a hard time, but... Uh, and so I needed, I had it all worked done, but I needed like 20, 30 grand at the time just to, to launch it. And and he said, how much you need? And it was he a just check wrote overnight. a check, didn't he? That's pretty awesome. I, you know, I knew that you have shared that with me in the past. So I'm glad you're, you're sharing that, you know, for the big wide world. That was, that's kind of guy Nelson was. Yeah, he was, he was, he was, he was a gentleman. You know, but he, he knew you. He'd he'd read the first book. You know, that's when that's when I met you, Barry, when you were still doing the research for your first book. So that was probably fifteen years ago. That's yeah, you know, that's two thousand six, two thousand five, four, yeah. 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 Fifteen, sixteen yeah, years so, ago. Yeah. Well that's a long time ago, yeah. So that was a really good that was a really good book. And uh so I could see how Nelson would write a check and help a guy out with the second book. <laughs> yeah, so it was good. I paid him right back, James. I released yeah. it, and then I sold where do you, it. Where do you think he got the money, Barry? He got it from his life insurance policy. <laughs> oh, that's funny. I like that. <clears throat> you know, all you need is, a, James, you know, all you need is a Mickey Mouse plan, right? There you go. Tell us about the Mickey Mouse plan. Well, this is, this is a true story, and I was thinking about this um, – I was in California last week. And I was thinking about it, is that uh, when Walt Disney, uh, in around 1952, thereabouts, uh, James, uh, at the time, you know, Walt Disney had this vision that he was going to have a clean theme park and uh, with, di- with just amusement rides and no liquor or anything like that, no carnies. And everyone said, "Walt, you can't, you can't set a, a amusement park as a, as a clean place, and you have to have bars and." 
all this, you know, the carnies and all this crazy stuff. Everyone thought he was crazy. Yeah. They said you were nuts. And so he, he was turned down by his brother and his investment banks, uh, bankers, because he, he still was raising money in Wall Street, and everyone turned him down. Uh, so what Walt Disney did is he had a house, dessert, a, um, a second home, uh, like in Palm Springs, uh, California, and he sold that for cash, and he had some loyal employees lend him some money. But the major funding for the Disney uh, Disneyland in Anaheim uh, came from a life insurance policy. So if there wasn't uh, Walt Disney's a huge, uh, it was a, it was a huge uh, loan back then. It was like a two hundred thousand dollar loan. So wow. think about that today, James. Wow. I mean, so he was spending. <clears throat> You know, hundreds of thousands of premiums back then. Now, let's <clears throat> let's talk about that for a minute, Barry. A two hundred thousand dollar loan from life insurance, and back then the PUA rider, the paid up edition rider, did not exist. So that would be a typically structured life insurance policy. That man had been paying substantial premiums, substantial, huge to get, back then to get to a two hundred thousand dollar loan. Back he, he had a big business back then. He, uh, yeah. he, he was in the animation and all that stuff. Yeah. He still had hundreds of people working for him, the whole thing. So the key man insurance was really uh, was insurance in case he croaked. But anybody he used his life insurance when everyone turned him down for collateral. And then he used that collateral to uh, hire the architectural firm who came with the grand plans for the uh, Disneyland in Anaheim, I guess that's where it is. And um, so it wasn't for his life insurance loans, Jane. There would be no Disney today, which is probably is one of the biggest media companies in the world. I yeah. think it's a, it has to be one of the biggest right now. I'm sure. So I'm- all all your listeners need is a Mickey Mouse plan. There you go. But maybe we don't have two hundred thousand dollars in premium. Yeah. So it's just. But this is what he was paying back then. Yep, I agree with the Mickey Mouse plan. There's, net, he's not the only one. He's just a household name, right? But there have been others: a pampered chef. Um, even Babe John Ruth. McCain uses it when he was running for president. But was that guy even you, insurable? I'm kidding. <laughs> I'm kidding. <laughs> he was. He's no longer. Yeah, right. He, he's a John McCain's McLean now, but but no, he uses. Uh, oh, oh, oh. <laughs> well, I'm sure they paid promptly. But James, you know, I just, I just, you know, from a personal experience, I've had, a, you know, a bunch of claims. I had a client for 15 years, this wonderful woman. I invested a couple million bucks for her, okay, and um, everyone said, keep it in the market, keep it in the market. Well, she had just lost like 300, uh, she lost 400,000 in the market with uh, infidelity, I call it fidelity, whatever you want. <laughs> she had pulled out a 300,000 ill-time um, uh, distribution, and so she was out like, she had a $2 million account. It was down to like $1.3 million. She gave the money to me. Um, we invested that money in like three annuities, an immediate annuity. We did a bunch of gifting for the grandchildren and the children. We did some insurance trust because it was a state tax issue at the time. And she just died this past year. Wonderful, wonderful woman. Um, she was very kind to me and believed in me when the kids thought I was crazy. But anyway, she gave us 1.3 million. We gave back to her 2.4 million in benefits, and it was all done efficiently. No accountants, no attorneys, and um, it was all liquid. You know, between life insurance and annuities, which were left over in the IRAs and so forth. And um, we also helped her. Um, uh, there was money sitting around in a uh, uh, her husband's trust, which we used to buy a vacation home for. Uh, for someone in, in, in a beautiful uh, uh, lake in New Hampshire. So, you know, we, we do this, this kind of work, and I think, um, uh, you know, we, we don't get much credit for it, but that, 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 was, a, that was a true story. And, um, uh, but this yeah, we, do, we, we don't do. really get a lot of credit. We get a lot of, you know, accusations sometimes. Um, but it's, it's all right. Uh, you know, I think we do a noble work. I think we do good work in um, – and I'm happy to do it. It's very fulfilling. I get to meet cool people like you. I get to meet cool people like the people that are listening. Um, I can't think of a better thing to be doing except traveling with my family. I mean, what else is there? You know, your family. Yeah, family is the most important thing. Right. <clears throat> but, um, you know, that kind of reminded me of uh, a situation here, you know, relatively recently. 
you know, people die, people graduate, right? That's just the other, the other end of life. You know, we're born, and then someday we're going to graduate. Yeah. Right? We don't know when. Um, and life insurance, by golly, comes with a death benefit. The only, the only financial tool that has liquidity, right, control by contract, it's guaranteed, and and it has that death benefit and the death benefit is a tool so i mean it's the only financial product and i'm not you can't boil it down to just two or three characteristics at all and i'm not trying to do that but what other asset can you own that you can spend the majority of and still leave a remainder tax free and have all that liquidity between now and then and if you look at life insurance when you just like you kind of mentioned earlier you use some other products and did some other things with that particular client um did her family lose anything no, they made did, they made it like one point three million or whatever. Right. You know, did it's they, just, did they get to enjoy the 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 house on the lake? You yeah, know, they did they give the anything lake. up? We converted stuff into capital gains. It, it was just it, it it really worked out. But we you know we, we we get the um, uh, unfortunately um, we get the the bad rap. But I know you are, we're both registered investment advisors. We handle people's money, their savings, other life insurance. Some people have no insurance with us, um, huh. but. Um, and, but, uh, you know, James, I, I've, I've actually had to sell some, you know, some pretty large estates and, uh, people in their death that have asked me to help them sell their estate, which I've done and help sell a car dealership, which was, uh, you never want to do that again, but, um, <laughs> you know, it's, uh, cause he asked me on, on, uh, and I get paid well uh, to do this, but, um, but you're right. I mean, but the, but the big thing was that when, when this guy died, he, he was very close to me. We were close, very close. Um, his widow, because we had uh, like over 1.1 million just sitting in the bank from life insurance proceeds. We left it with the company, so they had to give us three, four um, percent. We were, we were, we were in a great position. We had all, we had all the, we we were under any pressure. And, and, and this is people understand. So here's something that was very wealthy, and. <laughs> but the, but the legal fees, uh, you know, on the, on this stuff, uh, as you know, I don't know if you've been through the, some of these things, but the legal and accounting fees, whew, uh, it was just in, in, incredible. God uh, love the attorneys, but I haven't met a one who doesn't believe they're underpaid. Yeah, and and, and yeah. So <laughs> this is, you know, I did well, but the, the the attorneys made a killing, and it was a great, very good law firm. Don't get me wrong, and and we needed them because we were dealing with some pretty high. Sure. Powered up. Yeah. Uh, Every worker is worthy of his hire. No, yeah, and, no and issue. The, so, so the you know we had great attorney, but there was there was. Uh, there was it costs money to die, don't it? Just say it, it costs money to die today. That's what it. Yeah, that's it, the this, way is, it is. this is a big six figures. You know, uh, it wasn't seven figures, but it was close. Yeah, you know, so um, but this is you know we're, uh, but this is the beauty of uh, what we do and how we can help people. All right, so I, I'll be able to put the links to your videos in the uh, notes below whenever they're produced. Is that right? Perfect. Any parting words? Any Anything you want to leave us with? Um, no pressure. I don't mean to put no you on the spot. No pressure, man. It's just, yeah. <laughs> uh, well, educate yourself, okay? Don't take my word for it. Don't take your words for it. Educate yourself. Learn about um, our finance. Really, because we, as Nelson Nash again, getting back to him, he said we don't have an educational system. We have an indoctrination system. That's what we have. So the problem is, is so, and we're never taught about any of the stuff in, in, in school about finance. Or I don't know. I went to college or something, James. I, I was never taught any of this stuff. Um, I'm, I'm pretty much self-taught, you know. So yeah. um, I guess maybe the, the thing is, to, yeah, check out my website, barryjamesite.com. Um, we'll be putting up on more uh, videos and uh, on target date funds, index funds, the uh, Taylor Swift one for, you, for your daughter and people like that. But um, I'm yeah. gonna I'm gonna look at that video, the man. I'm gonna yeah, the man. Out. I think it's already got 14 million hits. But anyhow, my video explains what's behind um, uh, what's behind this. Well, hurry up and get your video out. I mean, which one should I watch first? <laughs> I know they're all done. It's, I'm just kind of I'm t turning it over to technical people, James. You know, I did the research enough for me at this point. Yeah. All right. Well, Barry, <clears throat> as always, 
<clears throat> excuse me, Barry, as always, thank you for coming on and chatting with me on this episode. Maybe you can come back and, you know, we can talk more about whatever you like to talk about. I enjoy speaking with you, your wealth of knowledge, and I want people to know who you are and what you do, and they should expose themselves to your work. I think that it would benefit you greatly, you listening. And it could benefit you, too. You never know. You might have might, might meet some, you know, new friends. You never and, know. And, James, yeah. it's, always, it's always great talking with you. And I guess I will see you uh, in June a couple of times anyhow, huh? Yeah, you should come to Fort Worth more often, you know. Um, but, yeah, absolutely. June, September, whenever. Love to do that. Yeah, love to come down to Texas. I'm not going to come down when it's cold, but uh, – but we'll oh, definitely. How far are you from Dallas? Uh, I'm 20 minutes southwest of Dallas, so I'm due south close, of huh? Fort Worth. Yeah, it's. I say 20 minutes, 30 now probably with traffic. All right, because 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 my uh, my graphics gal who does all my web work and the whole thing, she's she's uh, relocated from California to uh, to Dallas. So yeah, everybody's relocating from California to Texas because <laughs> they hate. California hates capitalists. <laughs> okay, I'll, I'll quit. All right, Barry. So you die, come, James. Yeah, that's right. When you when you come down to see your your tech girl, you can. I'll buy you dinner. I'll buy you lunch. Something breakfast. Something like that. It'd be great, James. Right. As always, my man. All right, Barry. Thanks. Have a great day. Thank you. Thank you. Bye bye. Thank you for joining us on the Banking with Life podcast. If you're watching on YouTube, make sure to like and subscribe and click on that little notification bell. Otherwise, join us on Apple Podcasts and Stitcher for weekly content.